we were called Vineyard because we were inspired by John Wimber and he was all about moving in the power of the spirit, um, seeing healing. And, and so in a sense, we were inspired by the values, I guess, of the Vineyard movement, but we were never officially a Vineyard church. And it wasn't a problem to begin with because the Vineyard church weren't big in uh, the UK. Um, but over time, they started to plant churches and grow, as did Vineyard Church in Loughton. I started looking at the Bible, always a good place to go, <laughs> um, at name changes in the Bible. And it occurred to me that um, whenever anybody changed their name in the Bible, it was God who did it. And I had no doubt that God was saying now's the time to change your name as a church um but i wondered whether we'd just lost the okay lord so what is our name we had a number of words that mentioned um a number of prophetic words that mentioned the word restore in one way or another and so over time it felt like god is saying something about restore i'm obviously aware of psalm 23 that talks about uh, the lord is my shepherd but it goes on he restores my soul um, and so it felt like there's something to do with people restoration that's significant. And then I've always loved, I think we've always loved Isaiah 61, which Jesus quotes in Luke 4 when he begins his ministry. It's kind of his manifesto. And we realized that Isaiah 61 verse 4, which was a word we were given a couple of times, talks about rebuilding the ancient ruins and restoring the places long devastated. And so it just felt like the Holy Spirit was speaking restore over us. I think the name represented who we were as a church, but then probably provided the um, parameters maybe as a church going forwards and, and helped us with clarity of vision and direction. I think it is who we had become, um, but then gave us an identity for ourselves and for others moving forwards. Stephen Murray, uh, I contacted him and said, if we were going to serve the local community, how could we best do that? He said, come and have coffee with me and Rose Brooks. So I met them in Loughton for a cup of coffee. I said, we've got volunteers, we've got heart. How could we best serve the local community? They thought about it and they said, take hold of a lease of a shop on Debden Broadway and run it as a drop-in centre. I was like, great idea. How are we going to do that? The shop was a community. We were open five days a week and people gathered and we were known and we could be known. We opened on Christmas Day and we could celebrate together Sunday gatherings specifically to talk about our faith, baptisms, and during the week, lots of problem solving, amazing volunteers from the community, the games group, an art group, uh, Matt joining the team, being part of the Broadway community, the beginning of Grow Garden, friendships that were formed, and lives that were changed, and realising that our lives were the Bible that people could read. There were prophetic words that encouraged us. Long before the Grow Garden came into being, there was a picture of us being a garden. Also, about the shop being a light, where people could come and take the light and take it into their own homes. And I can still remember the uh, Melvin and, and Heather Harrison decorated all, came up with all the different ideas for the feel, the cafe style, everything else like that. I still remember the Friday morning that I wore a restore <laughs> a, a hoodie and uh, we invited the local council and we cut the ribbon and we opened it. And I think it was a statement of this is the kind of church that God's called us to be. There are so many stories from that time. Um, some of them, obviously, I can't share in this context, but a formational one was when a guy came in. He said he'd, he was in his 50s and he said he'd just been released from jail. He needed to reapply for his benefits and had to do it online. He found it difficult to read and write and he knew he couldn't do it. And while he was talking to me, he started to have a panic attack and I was able to reassure him and say that it was going to be all right and we would be able to sort it out. And we did. And then there was the time when an assistant came from another shop and said they had a customer who was very stressed because she'd had a letter about her property in Spain and she couldn't read, it was in Spanish and she couldn't read Spanish. And was there any way somehow we could find someone to help? Well, Diana was on duty that day. She, of course, is a Spanish speaker. And she was able to go and translate 
and it was all sorted. To be able to welcome the vulnerable and the needy, plus anyone else who wanted to, into the community space there was just everything that makes my heart sing. And, and actually, I think if you track uh, multiplication and growth, it's all come from that point on. In fact, it was the opening of the community centre that got Don's attention that meant Doxadeo came to us. I think we stepped into something in the spirit and I think it opened a door of blessing. Well, Don and uh, some of his team hung around the community centre because they loved what we were doing and wanted to be supportive of it. And then Don invited me for coffee. We normally got together once, once, once a month or every few weeks in their restore community centre. And this one day I said, I want to come and have tea with you, but, but this time I have an agenda. Normally we had no agenda, we just shared, prayed together, and whatever the needs or the issues were at the time became the agenda. But I said, this time I've come with an agenda, I'd like to take you on a date. <laughs> and he said, should I become uncomfortable? And I said, then I told him, you know, when it's like when, when young people get together, they go on a date and then they get engaged and get married. And I said to him, you know, what about the possibility of us considering joining the two churches together? So then I went to the oldest and said, right, here's a crazy thing. What do you think about this? And uh, we decided, like, uh, like you should in, in all good relationships, like get to know one another a bit more, ask all the difficult questions and all of that sort of stuff, see if there's a seeming chemistry between the two. Do, does it feel like we truly do carry the same heart and really are compatible? And as we went along the journey, um, all the answers were yes. And then on, the, on, I think it was the 16th of December, 2012, we actually had that ceremony where the two churches joined together. Ian King and I, we threw down our rods, as it were, symbolically, and picked them up together as one new staff for the future. So, and I think that, and, and of course for the South Africans, and we, we, we weren't just a South African church, but majority South African, the fact that, that our tribe felt adopted, felt accepted uh, into the bigger family and the bigger community, I think that was very significant for me, but also for, for our members, that we were now part of a community church that had vision to see the community restored. It was such an amazing gift to us. And I don't think um, merging churches is necessarily easy. And yet, that was incredibly easy. And that doesn't mean there weren't things we didn't do well or, or lessons we could learn from it. But it was incredibly easy. But I think it was incredibly easy because God graced us for that. My privilege was to be involved in teaching and discipling and, you know, serving alongside with, with Ian and Chris and, and the eldership at the time but also getting involved pastoring people's lives. So I could, I could be free to live out my ministry in terms of being a pastor and a teacher, but still being involved in the nations because we, got in, we still were involved in the Ukraine. I was able to take a, a restored team to, to Mongolia. So I could still be involved in the nations, but then when I was home locally to live out my pastoral heart. So that was very significant and yeah, important for me here. Yeah. And I, I think that was what always, that was at the heart of everything I did when it came to, um, you know, the, the women stuff I did. And, and also probably still very much drives, you know, my engagement with faith and, and the groups I do even now. Because what, what always struck me about that story is the transformation that happens. So this is a woman who comes to the well. She comes at the wrong time of the day because you know, probably she didn't want to be with the other women. Most women would have come very early in the morning before the sun shone, and she comes midday, you know, on her own. And, and, and I think as a woman, I, I get that. I get the, 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 that sense of judgment, of, 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 of not feeling good enough, of, 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 you know, the journeys that you walk on your own. But whatever happens in that single encounter, and, and that word encounter was at the bottom of a lot of the stuff we did, you know, in terms of women, it was about that encounter, because whatever happens in that space, in that encounter, transforms her so much that she forgets her, she even forgets her vase. She doesn't, it says that she left her vase and she ran. So the very thing that brought her to the well, she leaves it. And she runs all the way back. And I always wondered what it was that she said and how she said it, that this woman who would have been despised, who would have been looked down on by people, was able to convince her entire town to come back with her to a well when she wouldn't have even had a mobile phone to check whether Jesus was still there. 
And there's so much power in that. And, and so everything for me about the women's ministry was about what, what is it? And, and that because I had that transformation and, you know, knowing Jesus, engaging with him has transformed totally who I am and continues to do so. And so everything we did around the women's ministry was how do you provide spaces and even the, the way we designed the spaces, working with the wonderful Grays and very so other people was about people coming into those spaces and having that encounter with Christ that enabled them to go away, leaving what it was they brought and, and just being totally transformed. Wes went on sabbatical, came back, and I was going to tell Wes over the next year or so, we'd like to investigate how we could maybe begin to transition to go into Africa. And before I got to open my mouth, Wes came back with the, we've heard from God and actually we're moving on and we think you should take over the church. And I was like, <laughs> how do I decision make now? And so um, I went back, talked to Chris, we prayed it through over the next uh, few days, a uh, couple of weeks. Um, and we ended up saying to the elders, look, we had this plan and we're really passionate about Africa, but we feel like we should take on leading Vineyard. As the story goes, he had a dream one night um, about a mechanics college in Africa. Uh, now, my brother was never the intrepid traveler. <laughs> and so that was a bit of a shock to him. And the very next day, uh, a family friend of ours phoned up and said to my brother, oh, I've got a friend in Zambia who's a bishop who's wanting his church to be more outward focused and he's wondering about a mechanics college. And as soon as he said that, my brother thought, oh, I think God might be trying to speak to me. <laughs> and so he ended up going over to Zambia um, with our friend uh, to meet this bishop and discovered there was already a mechanics college in the town, a Christian mechanics college doing amazing work. And so said to our friend, Bishop Innocent, you know, there's, there's already this college, what else is your church doing that we could support? And it turns out there were community schools that had started in church buildings, offering education to kids who would otherwise not be in school. So mostly orphans and vulnerable children. And so my brother was like, yep, we can support that. And that's how kind of the, the beginning started. So I wasn't involved in that at all. I was living overseas, working for another charity, another ministry. Um, and so they supported this school in building classrooms. And then I returned to the UK in 2009, uh, just after the first building trip had happened and uh, my brother said to me we've started this connection in Zambia it might turn into something do you want to take it on and I said no <laughs> little did I know right I said no and um, I said I'll do it for a year I'll, and see if it's a viable project and then if it is I'll hand it on to someone we then set up a meeting with Ben and Jody and me and Melissa Whitcomb at the time who was running our operations who'd worked at Beyond Ourselves in Zambia. And so we had a meeting of the four of us and it was like, God has to be in this because this is such a random group of people and yet we have such a commonality of heart. And out of that, it, it became, well, why don't we just put the two things together? Um, because we'll be helpful to one another. I think we had no idea that the journey would take us where it did. But again, that's part of, I take one step and I probably, you know, maybe wouldn't sign up for the whole journey if I knew what was coming, but I take one step because it feels good. And isn't it amazing to see what God then has done off the back of it? We work in two areas. Uh, one is in education development, specifically kind of literacy. And we teach teachers how to teach English. <laughs> so, um, and we've created a contextualized program that takes learners in Zambia from their local language to English language, which is the official language of Zambia. And uh, we've seen great success in that and have been given the green light from the government to go nationally and roll that out across the coming years uh, to impact the nation. And then the other thing uh, we do, so we've got education development and then kind of this kind of heart for discipleship and so using the, the wonderful program of Dignity and Dare uh, from our friends down in South Africa and inviting young people, boys and girls, to discover their identity, their purpose and their belonging in Jesus. And then kind of how that impacts the rest of their life, particularly around sexual health, um, around some of the pressures that come on them as teenagers and how to make wise choices in life as disciples of Jesus.